having said that there's 275 people or more, what we're going to try to do here, uh, because it's not really easy to have into, you know, to allow uh, verbal verbal communication or comments and questions. What we'd like you to do is, as you listen to um, Elizabeth Lavat, um, her presentation, if what you could do is put any comments or questions that arise during her uh, during her presentation in the chat box. And at the end of her presentation, what I'll do is I will I will take those questions and I will put, either put them to to uh, to Elizabeth directly, or what I'll do is put them together if they cut across a number of themes um, in order to expedite the process. Um, so. Uh, not verbal questions tonight, only questions through the chat line. And what I'll do is I'll put those to um, Elizabeth or because we have two other guest commentators and, uh, and um, uh, special questioners, um, doc, um, Professor Barbara Elliott from the um, Ecological Restoration Program at, uh, at Fleming College and uh, Dr. Norman Yan, um, formerly of the uh, Dorset Environmental Science Center past chair of the Friends of the Muskoka Watershed Council um, and a um, former York University professor um, and joining us to, to actually bridge the, the, uh, the time from Elizabeth's uh, presentation to the, the, the full question and answer period. So that's what we've got planned in terms of how we're going to move from uh, Elizabeth's presentation to the Q and A's. Um, and so again, we're asking you to do three things in the, in the chat function, one, is to put any suggestions you've got with regard to future, future Enviro cafes that you'd like to see us sponsor. Secondly, any comments and questions that you have. And the third thing is that you can also pose a question um, later on to either Norman or to Barb or to all three of our, of our guests tonight. And, and together we'll try to, to see whether or not we can crowdsource an answer. So um, I think that that's all I need to say at the moment. Um, oh, by the way, we are going to put out tomorrow um, a list of, of, of background resource information in case anybody wants to take a little bit of a deeper dive into any of the issues that are uh, raised today. We've, we've actually put together a resource list, so we'll be sending that out by email uh, sometime tomorrow. We're also going to be taping tonight's session, and that session will, uh, as soon as we possibly can, will be posted up on the Environment Halliburton website. So without uh, any further ado, I'm going to just turn the matter over to uh, Dr. Elizabeth Favat. Thanks, Terry. Um, thanks for inviting me to speak with Environment Halliburton tonight. I'll just get my screen going here. Okay, can you all see my slides? Yep, yeah. good. Okay. Um, so yeah, thank you for inviting me to speak with you tonight. Um, as Harry mentioned, I'm new to the area and I'm uh, very excited to be here. So tonight I'm gonna be speaking out about the ecology of blue-green algae and also about the research that I did for my PhD to investigate long-term environmental conditions leading to blue-green algal blooms in Ontario lakes. To start off, although the term blue-green algae is commonly used, it's not actually correct. Um, if you hear the term cyanobacteria, I'm just gonna close that there. If you hear the term cyanobacteria, that's the more correct term for blue-green algae um, that's used in the scientific community, but they mean the same thing. Blue-green algae are cyanobacteria. And the reason that the term blue-green algae is misleading uh, is because cyanobacteria are actually fundamentally different from other true forms of algae, like the diatoms or green algae. Rather, cyanobacteria are photosynthetic bacteria. They're one of the oldest organisms on the planet and evolved about 3 billion years ago. And the blue-green algae played a critical role in the evolution of nature as we know it, because they were responsible for the great oxidation event of our atmosphere. Because of this really long evolutionary history of 3 billion years, cyanobacteria are well adapted to many different conditions. And so you can find them in most illuminated environments on earth, everywhere from in the snow of glaciers at the poles to hot springs um, in partnerships with fun fungi and some types of lichen. Um, and of course, they're a very common component of our oceans and freshwaters. There are over 2,700, 
700 named species of cyanobacteria, but the group probably contains several thousand more than that that we haven't discovered yet. And the species of cyanobacteria have diverse forms from unicellular lifestyle, like these picocyanobacteria, to colonial or groups of cells like microcystis, to filamentous forms like these ones with specialized cells that allow the algae to perform different functions like nutrient acquisition and um, surviving adverse environmental conditions. And actually the size difference from the smallest forms of cyanobacteria to the largest colonies like those of microcystis is like the size difference between a flake of ground cayenne pepper and a soccer ball. And this size difference has large ecological implications as the larger forms like these microcystis colonies are less likely to be eaten by zooplankton. But of all the thousands of species of cyanobacteria, there's actually only a handful or a couple dozen that form blooms in fresh water. And that's um, species in the groups shown in these photos. So my background is that I recently completed a PhD in biology, which used paleolimnology to examine long-term environmental conditions and potential drivers for cyanobacterial blooms in Ontario lakes. And I'm gonna explain that work later in this presentation. And currently I work with the Federation of Ontario Cottagers Associations and the Ministry of the Environment's Dorset Environmental Science Center to help organize the Ontario Lake Partner Program. And this is the largest citizen science water quality monitoring program of its kind in Canada. And so if we look at this map of Ontario here, all these points on the map show all of the lakes that are sampled under this program. And I'll speak a little bit more about that program later in the presentation as well. So what exactly is a blue-green algal bloom? Well, there's actually no strict scientific definition, but it generally describes a visible accumulation of algae. So it's when one or a few species come to dominate the algal community in a water body. But blooms can be measured in different ways. So for instance, they can, blooms can be measured based on total cell counts per liter of water or based on the proportion of the algal community that's made up of by a certain species or based on concentrations of photosynthetic pigments like chlorophyll. The name blue-green algal bloom is also misleading because blooms are not always blue-green in color. So uh, take a couple seconds and see if you can guess which of these images uh, are comprised of blue-green algae and which are not. So this image, this image, and this image are all cyanobacteria or blue-green algae, but this image isn't. It shows duckweed, which is a plant. Um, this is green algae, which is typically very stringy and slimy in texture. And this picture is tree or terrestrial pollen on the water. So even to the trained eye, sometimes blue-green algae, blue, algae blooms can be tricky to distinguish from other types of algae or other growths on the water um, until a sample is put under the microscope and then it's very easy to tell. But generally, if you see kind of a consistent opaque pea soup green, it could be cyanobacteria. And you can call a biologist and they'll figure it out for you. Blue-green algal blooms are on the rise worldwide and have been detected in more and more water bodies over the last few decades. And here are some examples of cyanobacteria in Canadian lakes that have had recent media coverage. On the rise in Muskoka, resulted in the death of three dogs in the Maritimes, in the drinking water reservoir for Moncton, uh, taking over Canadian lakes. And then this report here was recent. It was linking recent and believed to be unprecedented blooms in Lake Superior to climate warming. In Ontario specifically, the number of confirmed cyanobacterial blooms each year, which is shown by the light green portion of these bars, has significantly increased over the last two decades, and the bloom occurrences are quite widespread across the province. And although maybe you've heard that nutrient pollution from runoff is the most common culprit of cyanobacterial blooms globally, which is true, um, about one in four of these confirmed blue-green algal blooms is on, in Ontario are actually from lakes with average total phosphorus concentrations in the oligotrophic or very low range. 
And still more bloom reports are coming from lakes where nutrient levels have been stable or even declining in recent decades. So the lakes that my research has focused on are ones that deviate from the simple nutrient enrichment algal bloom paradigm. And, and this data here suggests that there may be other factors contributing to the rise of cyanobacteria across Ontario, aside from simply increased nutrient runoff. One of the major consequences of cyanobacterial blooms that people are most concerned about is their ability to produce toxins. Um, these are the four main groups of toxins that are produced by freshwater cyanobacteria. And there are many different variants that fall within each of these four broad toxin groups. Um, by far the most common toxin associated with freshwater blooms are the microcystins, um, which are hepatotoxic or toxic to the liver. Many types of cyanobacteria can produce more than one type of toxin, and the same toxin can be produced by multiple species of cyanobacteria. In these broad categories here, not all species within them are capable of synthesizing toxins. And this one's important. Even if we know there's a species that has the potential to produce toxins, it doesn't always. And when uh, cyanobacteria produces toxins or not, it likely depends on specific environmental conditions that we don't understand yet. So for that reason, a precautionary approach is taken where if there's a suspected blue-green algal bloom, we take a sample, we put it under the microscope, find out which species it is. And if it's a species that we know has the ability to produce toxins, we assume that toxins could be present until the bloom dissipates. This is a map of total microcystin measurements in lakes in the USA and in Canada. And I apologize for the look of this map. I had to piece together data from the National Lakes Assessment in the US, which was a very broad scale survey of cyanobacterial toxins in lakes with the broadest survey that I could find or that exists for Canada, which is um, Diane Orahel's work. And she was actually on my thesis examining committee. Um, but a, a similar broad scale survey like the one done in the States is underway for Canada as part of the Lake Pulse project, but it, the results just aren't out yet. But what we see if we look at this map is that uh, clearly cyanobacterial toxins are a widespread issue, despite being a relatively new area of research with the first microcystin toxin being isolated and characterized in the late 1980s. Um, on the last slide, we were talking about all the different types of toxins that can be produced by cyanobacteria, but health guidelines are only actually in place for microcystin. And in Canada, that is set at 1.5 micrograms per liter total microcystins acceptable in drinking water and 20 micrograms per liter for recreational waters. So you can look at the size and the color of these dots here. So if you see yellow dots in Canada, or the larger dots in the states, those are bodies of water where the water has more microcystins than are acceptable for drinking water. So there are a fair number of water bodies where this is the case. There can be very serious consequences of freshwater cyanobacterial toxins. The two most well-known incidents involve the death of 60 patients at a dialysis clinic in Brazil in the mid 1990s when water contaminated with almost 20 micrograms per liter of microcystins was used for their treatment. Um, and of all the patients affected, it, it killed about a third of them. So these toxins can be very lethal. Um, more recently in Toledo, Ohio on Lake Erie in 2014, microcystin concentrations exceeded the drinking water quality standards in treated and finished tap water. So the city had to send out an urgent message um, warning residents not to drink the tap water, not to try to boil the tap water. And so for two days, the city's population of nearly half a million people, or people were left without tap water because of blue-green algal toxins. But it's not all just about the potential for toxin production. There are negative consequences of both toxin producing and non-toxic blooms. Of course, blooms that produce toxins are a health risk to humans and animals, but whether or not blooms are toxic, the biomass produced during blooms reduces water clarity or increases turbidity, 
And this can lead to biodiversity loss through a reduction in the growth of other photosynthetic aquatic organisms. Um, the increased turbidity or reduced water clarity associated with blooms also reduces the aesthetic and economic value of the water body. Bottom water oxygen depletion, which is associated with the end of blooms when excess organic material is being decomposed can reduce the suitable habitat available for certain aquatic organisms and result in fish kills, and um, can also exacerbate internal nutrient loading from the sediments at the bottom of the lake, which can then result in a kind of positive feedback cycle that can further bolster future blooms. The causes of algal blooms can be highly complex, and this image pretty accurately sums up how I felt for most of my PhD, trying to figure out the causes of blooms. Um, a lot of current research is focused on being able to predict the co conditions under which future blooms will occur. But there's a line in a review of blooms in Canadian waters that I really like that states that, let alone predicting future blooms, it's difficult enough to even tease apart precisely which factors or thresholds are surpassed to have caused past blooms in certain water bodies when we know all of the conditions that happened at the time of that bloom. Despite the complexity, you can conceptually organize the interacting factors that can lead to blooms into these three main categories. Elevated nutrients from natural and human caused sources and from runoff from the catchment or from internal lake sources or the mud at the bottom. Specific weather conditions um, that lead to especially warm and, and stagnant water. Um, and food web alterations or changes in which or how much algae is being consumed by upper food web organisms. The dreaded climate change can alter conditions across all three of these categories to make conditions more favorable for blooms to occur. And so it can be kind of thought of as a threat multiplier in the case of conditions that promote cyanobacterial blooms. And so, um, just to switch gears a little bit here before I describe some of the main ways that climate warming is making blue-green alg algal blooms worse, we need to understand the process of thermal stratification in lakes. Um, so maybe many of you already know about this, but if you don't, um, in the spring after the ice melts off the lake, the water is cool and of uniform temperature, somewhere around four degrees Celsius. And so all the water in the lake mixes together and oxygen and nutrients are spread throughout the water column. Then through the summer, the surface of the waters, surface waters of the lake heat up and this creates layers of water of different temperature and therefore different density. And if the thermal gradient is steep enough, the layers of water become too different in density to mix with each other. And you might've felt this in your real life if you, jump into the middle of a deep lake near the end of the summer, if you reach down with your toes deep enough, you might hit a layer of much colder water underneath. And so when, if you hear the word thermal stratification, what it means is this layering of water of different temperatures, which occurs normally throughout the summer, depending on the specific lake. And during these stratified conditions, the hypolimnion, which is the cold, dense bottom waters, are isolated from atmospheric oxygen. And so the oxygen that is in this layer, when it becomes isolated, is slowly depleted throughout the summer as organisms there consume it. And when oxygen is depleted from the bottom waters, nutrients that are normally bound up in the sediments are released into the overlying waters. And this process is called internal nutrient loading. So it's been widely hypothesized that climate change will result in more frequent, severe, and widespread blue-green algal blooms on a global scale. And this is because cyanobacteria possess certain adaptations that allow them to thrive and outcompete other algae under the conditions imposed by climate change. Specifically in moderately deep temperate lakes, recent warming is resulting in longer and stronger periods of the thermal stratification in lakes that we just talked about as well as a longer ice-free growing season. And bloom forming cyanobacteria do well under these climatic conditions, firstly, because they generally grow better than other types of algae at water temperatures around 25 degrees Celsius and over that. Secondly, um, and this, this point is maybe the most important 
these bloom forming species of cyanobacteria possess gas vesicles, which allow them to control their buoyancy. So it's kind of like little life jackets. And it means that unlike other algae groups like the diatoms that slowly sink out of the light that they need to photosynthesize under a stagnant water column, these cyanobacteria can optimize their position and are not reliant on turbulence within the lake to remain suspended in the upper waters where they can photosynthesize. And this buoyancy regulation also allows them to monopolize the illuminated areas of the lake and outcompete other algae groups by shading. And also um, for cyanobacteria that are capable of this buoyancy regulation, they can migrate down in the water column up to about 10 meters, we think, to access bottom water nutrient pools, which form through internal loading from the sediments. So the main question that I examined in my PhD research was what environmental conditions have changed in lakes that could be driving recent blooms that we've seen increasing across the province of Ontario. And since the lakes that I studied have very little historical monitoring data, I used paleolimnology to answer this. And paleolimnology is a branch of lake science that examines fossil material in lake sediment to determine the environmental history of an ecosystem. And so how this works is that material from the atmosphere, from the catchment and from within the lake are continuously deposited as sediments to the bottom of the lake. And we take what's called a sediment core or just like a tube of this mud, which then provides us with a continuous record of environmental conditions in as well as around the lake from present day at the top of the core going back centuries or millennia as you move deeper in the mud. And the professor who supervised me liked to say that as you move deeper in the layers of this core, it's like turning through the pages of a history book to look further and further back in time. And so what this allows us to do is it allows us to extend the monitoring window for a particular lake, which is typically on the time scale of a couple of years or maybe a couple of decades in rare cases, back in time to hundreds or thousands of years ago to establish the environmental history of the lake and baseline conditions or what the lake was like before major disturbances of the industrial era. And so um, this is a quote I like, I actually put it in my thesis, it's from Rachel Carson. Um, she was talking about paleo-oceanography and she wrote this in the mid fifties, um, but it holds true for paleolimnology as well. And she said, the sediment sediments are a sort of epic poem of the earth. When we are wise enough, perhaps we can read in them all of past history for all is written here in the nature of the materials that compose them and in the arrangement of their successive layers, the sediments reflect all that has happened in the waters above them and on the surrounding lands. So some of the materials that preserve well in the sediment and that we can use to establish a lake's environmental history, which we call paleo-environmental indicators because they indicate information to us about past environments are chlorophyll A, which is a pigment present in all photosynthetic organisms. So it's useful to infer whole lake algae production or algae abundance through time. Cyanobacterial aconites, which are the resting cysts of certain bloom forming cyanobacteria. And they have a thickened hyaline cell wall, which preserves for thousands of years, unlike the normal um, vegetative cells of cyanobacteria. And so these aconites can be useful to indicate cyanobacterial abundance over thousands of years. The diatoms, which are another group of algae, and actually for every one in five breaths that you take, you can thank a diatom for producing that oxygen for you. But the diatoms have glass cell walls, so they preserve for thousands of years in the mud at the bottom of the lake, and we can use them to interpret how nutrient levels in a lake have changed because different species have different preferences for nutrient concentrations. And we can also use diatoms to examine how climate warming might be impacting a given lake because longer and stronger stratification, which is expected with warming, should also um, cause certain shifts in the diatoms like favoring slower sinking species. The chironomids or non-biting midges are a group of flies. This is what the adults look like, but they have a larval stage that lives in aquatic environments in the sediments that look something like this. And they're very sensitive indicators of changes in oxygen near the sediments or near the mud. 
and they're also commonly used to indicate changes in temperature. And lastly, the cladocerans, which are an important grazer on the algal community. And in fact, I have heard them referred to as the lawnmowers of the lake by Norman Yan, who's gonna be on the panel later. Um, and so some species of cladocera are more efficient lawn mowers than others. And so we can look at shifts in their fossil populations through time to indicate changes in food webs that control how much algae there is. And so the lakes I have studied have obviously all been impacted by blue-green algal blooms. And they're all quite typical cottage country lakes on the Canadian Shield. They're all classified as mesotrophic with respect to total phosphorus concentrations and they're medium depth, about five to 15 meters deep. So they're deep enough that they have periods of, of weak th thermal stratification in the summer. So I looked at three lakes near Sault Ste. Marie, Three Mile Lake in Muskoka, Dixon Lake, which is in the interior of Algonquin Provincial Park and Lake Nipissing. And so to demonstrate to you how paleolimnology and establishing environmental history of a particular water body can help us determine the drivers for current blue-green algal blooms, I'll tell you about the research I did on Calendar Bay of Lake Nipissing as a little case study. So Lake Nipissing is the third largest lake entirely within the province of Ontario. And actually I have a family cottage located like right about here. But today we're going to focus on Calendar Bay, which is this circular bay on the east end of the lake. And the municipality of Calendar pulls its drinking water from the bay, uh, which provides for about 4,000 people. And so toxin producing cyanobacterial blooms in the bay, which were first confirmed in 2000 and have occurred nearly annually since 2010, are exceptionally um, concerning here because it's an important drinking water source. So beginning in the late 1800s, Calendar Bay was a site of clear-cut logging. Um, there was a tourism boom to the depressed lumber town in the 40s because of the world's first surviving quintuplets that were born here. And since about the 70s, the logging industry has drastically declined, but cottaging tourism and the walleye sport fishery are very important contributors to the local economy. And cyanobacterial blooms have only been observed in Calendar Bay since 2000. But what about on a longer time scale? What was Calendar Bay like before the Industrial Revolution and substantial human impacts of the early 1900s? Did blooms just go unnoticed through the 20th century or are the frequent intense cyanobacterial blooms we've seen in the Bay over the last 20 years truly a new occurrence here? And if they are a new occurrence, then what's changed in the ecosystem of the Bay to cause the blooms to occur now? So those are some of the questions we wanted to try to look at by um, analyzing and trying to be wise about the changes in the fossils in the sediments. So um, we went and we got a core. Um, this is myself and Dr. Claire Nelligan. Um, we, my parents were kind enough to let us section the core in the porch and we tried to not get any mud on the floor. Um, but so this graph displays the fossil diatom data from the sediment core that we took. And remember that the diatoms can tell us about how nutrients and thermal stratification has changed through time. So how you read this graph, I know it's pretty complicated, but this is um, the most complicated graph I'll show you. So as you move down the page here, you're moving farther back in time. And the this date here is the year associated with each layer as you move down the page. And then each panel here represents a different species of diatom um, with the length of the bar showing how much of that species was found at that time period. And so what we saw was a complete reorganization of the diatom assemblages, assemblages of Calendar Bay throughout the sediment record. So in the pre-1880 period from about 12 centimeters in the core and downward, we see these Alacosaira species as our dominant diatom. Then we move into a distinct period from about 1890 to 1970. And during this time, there was land clearance through extensive logging in the Calendar Bay catchment, as well as damming at the outflow on the upper French river. And this period is characterized by um, a large decline in the previously dominant Alacosaira species and an increase in this diatom here um, called Fragilaria mesolepta, 
And Fragillaria mesolepta prefers higher nutrients than these alacosyrotaxa. So it suggests that through this period, nutrient concentrations in the bay became elevated. Then we move into sediments from the 21st century, which is the period of time where we saw blooms happen in Calendar Bay. And this period is characterized by a decline in Fragillaria mesolepta and its replacement by an increase in these small, slow sinking diatom species. And this shift from a pre-disturbance period uh, dominated by these Alacrosyra species to the period coincident with observed blooms over the last two decades in which these small, slowly sinking diatoms are at higher abundances suggests that longer or stronger periods of thermal stratification have occurred in Calendar Bay over the last couple of decades. And the same enhanced thermal stratification predicted to favor this diatom shift is also predicted to benefit blue-green algae, which can regulate their buoyancy to optimize their position in the water column and, they, and can therefore proliferate under these um, less well-mixed and more stagnant conditions. But this coincident timing in the sediment record, as opposed to say the timing of the blue-green algae blooms occurring coincident with this nutrient enrichment period, um, points to the fact that climate mediated changes in lake stratification is an important driver of the blooms in Calendar Bay. Large shifts also occurred in the coronamid assemblages of Calendar Bay throughout the sediment record. So in the pre-1880 period, assemblages were dominated by this species, Procladius. And then through the period of land clearance and damming, the relative abundance of Chronomus increased. And uh, Chronomus looks like this. It's commonly called, they're commonly called bloodworms. Um, their larvae contain hemoglobin, a lot like our blood. So they're able to very efficiently and tightly bind oxygen and therefore they can tolerate lower bottom water oxygen concentrations than these Procladius species. And so the transition from Procladius to Chronomus during this time suggests um, lower bottom water oxygen conditions through the 20th century in Calendar Bay. During the period of observed blue-green algal blooms in the 21st century, Procladius relative abundance declines further as does the overall number of chronomids I found in the mud. And this decline in overall abundance of chronomid fossils over the last two decades could indicate that oxygen loss near the sediments has become severe enough to not be able to support any chronomids, even the ones with hemoglobin that can bind oxygen very well at some times of the year, which results in lower number of fossils encountered. And so um, in this diagram, we have time running along the x-axis, like a timeline. And the green shaded area here represents the period that cyanobacterial blooms occurred in Calendar Bay or were observed in Calendar Bay from 2000 to present. And then the darker green lines indicate individual years that had blooms. And so the top panel of this figure displays uh, the concentration of photosynthetic pigments that were found in the core layers. And so it represents the amount of algal production through time or the amount of algae. And this shows an increasing trend from about 1930 to present day. Um, and this rise in algal growth occurs when climate change is also impacting the region. So in the nearby North Bay climate station records, we see an accelerated warming in air temperature since about 1980 declining wind speeds and fewer days of ice cover per year throughout the record, as well as wetter conditions in the 21st century. And these climate parameters here are all trending in a direction that favors blue-green algal blooms. The bottom two panels here show reconstructed bottom water oxygen and phosphorus trends, uh, which were interpreted from the biological fossils in the sediment core. And these trends show especially low oxygen, bottom water oxygen over the last decade, indicating a greater potential for internal nutrient loading. And diatom inferred total phosphorus indicates that concentrations were about 13 micrograms per liter uh, through the 1800s, and then underwent a period of nutrient enrichment through the 20th century, 
and then has recovered somewhat from eutrophication over the last 20 years. Um, at the same time that observed blooms have intensified. And an important aspect of paleolimnological studies like this one is that they allow us to quantify what conditions were like before direct monitoring and before human disturbance began. So here, if we take um, the average of paleo inferences um, from pre-1800 for bottom water oxygen and phosphorus, we can, that will provide us with historically informed management targets for this water body. So to conclude for this Calendar Bay case study, compared to the pre-disturbance conditions in the 1800s, the 21st century in which we saw frequent blue-green algal blooms in the bay is characterized by stable or even declining nutrient concentrations, suggesting that other factors are also at play driving the blooms. We see an increase in diatoms indicating periods of longer or stronger thermal stratification in Calendar Bay during the period of blooms as well as reduced bottom water oxygen at the same time. So it seems plausible here that with climate warming, Calendar Bay is transitioning from a well-mixed body of water to one that is more consistently uh, layered into those different temperature zones or thermally stratified. And under these conditions, oxygen would quickly be lost from the bottom waters and internal nutrient loading could create deep water nutrient pools to fuel algal blooms in the bay that we've seen over the last two decades. But if I consider the findings from all the research that I did for my PhD more broadly, so beyond Calendar Bay, what I've found is that nutrients are of course critically important to support blooms, but in terms of the drivers or triggers, they're not always the entire story. Um, our paleo inferences and reconstructions from sediment records suggested that most of the study lakes that I looked at are currently within background nutrient conditions seen several centuries ago. And so even if nutrients have not increased, blooms can still occur in the modern climate. And this is likely because climate warming has several consequences that bolster blue-green algal blooms, especially through a longer ice-free growing season, warmer surface waters, and longer and stronger thermal stratification which exacerbates internal nutrient loading. So what we're finding is that climate change is lowering the critical nutrient thresholds for blue-green algal blooms to occur. And what I mean by this is if we look at this graph and we take a look at um, phosphorus concentrations less than 20 micrograms per liter in this red box here. So this is where we used to expect only mild algal blooms only up to maybe 5% of the time. And this is exactly like the lakes I studied for my PhD. They all have less than 20 micrograms per liter of phosphorus. And yet in some of these lakes, blooms are recurring frequently um, annually in some of these lakes in recent decades. So with climate warming making conditions more favorable for blue-green algae, these curves are shifting leftwards and we will see more nuisance, nuisance blooms at lower nutrient thresholds moving into the future with continued climate warming. For what I can recommend for management, climate change is hard to control. And as Barb Elliott, who's gonna be on the panel after has said it, we need to look at what is in our sphere of influence and the science in what triggers blooms that I've outlined here is, is complicated, admittedly, but the implications and what we can do to mitigate them is actually relatively straightforward. What can we control? That's the nutrient inputs. We need to keep nutrient concentrations in lakes as natural as possible. And what that specific level is for each lake can be determined through paleo studies like those that I've done or through long-term monitoring. Controlling blooms once environmental conditions are right for them to reoccur annually is very difficult. Um, you might have heard of some chemical and other in-lake treatments uh, that can be used to try to mitigate blue-green algal blooms, but they're very costly and they're not a viable long-term solution. The best thing we can do is try to prevent blooms from occurring in the first place, and one of the easiest ways to do that is to minimize nutrient pollution running off from human activities in the catchment. 
And a very easy way to do that is to intercept nutrients running off the land with terrestrial plants, which can sequester these nutrients before they reach the lake. There will always be ecological surprises, especially since there are so many interacting factors that can lead to blooms. But I do believe that with further research, we will be able to pinpoint specific lakes that may be most sensitive to developing future algal blooms. And maybe a good start uh, to that is to look towards lakes that have moderate nutrient levels uh, or are classified as mesotrophic and lakes that are relatively shallow so that um, low oxygen conditions develop rapidly with thermal stratification. Lastly, I found that bottom water oxygen and nutrient concentrations indicating the occurrence of internal nutrient loading might be more useful for determining the potential for blooms than surface water concentrations. And so for groups that have the means, um, we should try to incorporate oxygen profiles or a bottom water chemistry sample into our monitoring programs. So while it takes a lot of highly specialized work and time, understanding environmental histories is the key to putting current water quality issues into context. And establishing baseline conditions is critical to inform management targets for parameters like nutrients. We need to know what the natural or baseline conditions in a given lake are, were like to be able to know what we're aiming for in restoration. And when monitoring data don't exist, paleolimnology and sediment records are a useful approach to be able to do this. Monitoring is of the utmost importance to have a sense of what's going on with the wa water quality in our lakes and how it's changing. And so at the Lake Partner Program, which I help to organize now, and maybe many of you on the call are familiar with, volunteers who live on or near lakes measure for phosphorus, water clarity using a secchi disc, calcium concentrations and chloride concentrations. And through the Lake Partner Program, over 550 lakes are monitored in the province each year, which is way more than scientists could do alone. This data is analyzed and quality controlled at the Dorset Environmental Science Center. And then the data are uploaded and can be used by anyone. And for many of the lakes I studied in my thesis, the Lake Partner Program actually provided the only monitoring data available, which highlights the importance of the work done by the Lake Partner Program volunteers. So I would recommend that you Google the Lake Partner Program, pull up this map here, which is on the internet and check out your local lake. And if there isn't currently an active volunteer on your lake, you should consider becoming a lake partner. It's completely free. We send you everything you need and you just sample and send the water and the readings back to us to be analyzed. Postage is paid for. And if you wanna know more, um, you can email us at lakepartner at ontario.ca or give us a call. Um, and so that was really probably way more detailed information than you wanted to learn about cyanobacteria on a Tuesday night. But here are some take home messages for you that I hope you'll take away tonight. Cyanobacteria are among the most ancient organisms on earth. And when they're in balance with the rest of the ecosystem, they're an essential and beneficial component. However, blooms or excessive growth of certain species of cyanobacteria can have very negative ecosystem level impacts. And unfortunately, we expect that with continued climate change, blue-green algal blooms will become increasingly frequent and severe moving into the future. And thank you all so much for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Elizabeth. That was great. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> um, I got to say that to, uh, to everybody um, on the line, that it looks like our participants for tonight got capped at 100, despite our efforts um, at Environment Halliburton to, uh, to, to expand our subscription to include much, much uh, larger numbers. And in fact, we were told up to 1,000, I believe. But something happened in the translation of that new subscription into reality. And it looks like um, anybody above 100 got locked out. So that's going to crimp our style from here on in. But um, uh, we did, we have been taping this session, so we will be putting it up as soon as possible on the EH 
website. Um, so um, before, I want to thank Elizabeth once again for her presentation. Um, we're going to now bridge into some questions, uh, comments, and, and, uh, and so on with, with anybody who's been listening. Um, and so we're going to start that process by, uh, by calling on our, our expert commenters and questioners. We're going to start with um, Professor Barb Elliott from uh, Fleming College. And uh, Barb gets the first crack at, at uh, asking a question to, to Elizabeth. So Barb, are you there and you're ready? I'm there, yeah, thank you, Terry. And uh, Liz or Dr. Favo, I should say appropriately, that was, uh, that was excellent, excellent presentation and lots of information, lots of thought provoking messages for people and uh, uh, you did a great job. So thank you for that. So as your research suggests, there, there are many factors that will influence uh, the occurrence of blue-green algal blooms. And it's complicated, as you've said, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and so there's, I'm sure lots of folks out there, like you've suggested in the Lake Partner Program, for example, who are out doing regular, um, regular data collecting on, uh, on our inland lakes, which is, is, is hugely helpful from a long-term data set. So from that sort of perspective of, of citizen science, I guess I'd say, um, what, what do you think would be additional information that would be useful for people to collect um, about their lake when they spot, for example, a potential uh, blue-green algal bloom? What kinds of uh, information could people collect that would help contribute to our better understanding of how these blooms might form in the future? So how can we contribute to building that kind of data set that would help us uh, sort of better, better get at those, at those answers. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a really great question because I think right now it's the reporting of blooms is kind of, it's not as efficient as it could be, especially because we rely on like the public will call in a bloom and then a scientist will go out to a lake and maybe they won't be able to get out there for a few weeks and then the bloom is gone. Right. And they, so we'll never know what it was. So when people living on lakes see what they suspect is a blue-green algal bloom, they should take some pictures, um, get a hold of, you're supposed to call the Spills Action Center um, and they'll come out and test it, but take some pictures, take a water sample, put it in your fridge or freezer, um, just in case the bloom kind of redistributes in the water column or dissipates quickly. Take a water sample, take pictures and take, any environmental information you can. So like, what were the, what were the winds like that day? How hot has it been for the previous week or um, how sunny is it? Uh, has it recently rained heavily? Those, all of that environmental information can be really useful in trying to figure out what might've triggered a bloom. Thanks, thanks Liz, that's great. Okay, so Norman, you're up. You get to ask uh, another question of, uh, of, of Elizabeth, then we go be, then we're going to go to the, to the chat line for other folks. Okay, Liz, that was great. Thank um, you. Uh, I'm going to ask sort of a two part question if I, if I can, the first kind of practical and the second more fundamental. The practical one builds on what Professor Elliot asked is, um, is it, would it be possible to get the lake partners out there sampling in late, in late summer? And do you know of anything that you could share with them that would easily allow them to collect a sample from near the bottom of the lake that they could actually use to measure oxygen in some way? Like, uh, is anything like that been considered for the Lake Partner Program? That's question number one. And the more fundamental one is, I can think of reasons why there should be more or less bottom water oxygen in Halliburton. Are there types of lakes where there should be less and that we should be particularly targeting as places where blooms may occur? Yeah, great question. So uh, the first one about lake partners sampling bottom waters potentially near the end of summer. That's something like I've only really started thinking about it recently and I don't know, maybe some lake associations have the equipment you need because you would need, I think, uh, um, an oxygen meter, um, which I don't know if people have, and, uh, or just a Van Dorn, um, which I, again, I don't know how expensive they are, but it's just a piece of equipment that um, you trigger it to close so it can just take water just from the bottom layer. And then 
if if people could access either of those pieces of equipment that it would be great to monitor bottom water conditions at the end of summer. Um, but for the second question uh, about like, so some lakes in our region might have more oxygen moving forward in the bottom waters, whereas kind of other lakes like the ones I talked about in this presentation are uh, losing oxygen faster throughout the summer. And I think that largely has to do with the volume of deep bottom water. So if you have a really large volume, it'll take much longer to lose oxygen. So our really um, big deep lakes, especially deep, very deep lakes um, and, and ligotrophic lakes with low nutrients, low nutrient deep lakes, we shouldn't be as worried about the potential for these blooms as in lakes that maybe are shallower, like any, well, really any depth up to about probably like 15 meters. Um, I'm just guessing at the depths here, but it's like an estimate. Um, and lakes that were traditionally polymictic or mixed frequently um, and are now becoming more consistently stratified. So they're losing oxygen in the bottom waters now uh, more severely which results in internal load. So I think it has to do with kind of like this, the depth of the lake as well as exposure to wind. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to ask one follow-up to what Norman just asked and just, and because some of our lakes may be deep but they have, they have very shallow embayments. And so, I, I mean, it's difficult to categorize a lake as being, you know, a huge and deep lake or a small and shallow lake they range all in between. If, if a lake has got, that would be deep, would have uh, shallow embayments, would those be areas that you would wanna pay special attention to as well? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Okay, we have a question from a lake steward from uh, Moore Lake Property Association. He, was say, he says that he was surprised to hear that the number of blooms that were occurring late in the year when water temperatures were dropping, um, he would have thought that the lower water temperatures would have stopped algae growth. Can you explain why it would be happening um, late in the season? Yeah, it, it might be that, um, so this is kind of a different driver than what I was talking about in my presentation. Um, but so stratify as lakes cool, as we move into the fall, stratification breaks down and the lakes mix. And um, if there was a lot of nutrients coming into the bottom waters through the summer in the stratified period, in the fall when they mix, that brings those nutrients into the surface waters and that could trigger a bloom. Um, or if there's a lot of nutrient runoff with precipitation in the fall, but I think usually it's, it's that first mechanism I talked about where when the lake starts to mix, that can trigger a bloom. <laughs> okay, so that same uh, lake steward, uh, from Moore Lake um, asked a second question, which had to do with the breakup of algal blooms. What causes the breakup and what happens to the dissipated algal material? I guess this is for me. I'll answer oh, first. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. But if anybody else wants to chip on, to jump in on that, that but I'll, I'll put them all to you, Elizabeth, and then you can pitch them to somebody else. Okay. Um, yeah, so blooms just, they, they'll they start to break down when conditions aren't right for them anymore. So maybe it's not sunny or warm enough for them anymore, or maybe they're, they've they lost their abil ability to stay in the illuminated area of the lake. And um, when they die, they eventually sink in the water column to the bottom. Um, and then they're, they're decomposed and uh, that uses up a lot of oxygen. So that can result in in bottom water low oxygen um, after a bloom, which can result in fish kills. But so yeah, after after a bloom breaks up, it kind of sinks uh, to wherever it was last deposited around the lake and stays on the bottom. And actually a lot of bloom species too have um, like specialized cells to overwinter um, or like survive, survive those conditions and then they can be brought into resuspension the next year and grow from there. Okay, Norman, you had you wanted to get in on that, I think. Yeah, I just, this is almost 
Liz is brave in, in trying to answer that question. <laughs> Consider this almost one of the unanswerables. There's probably 5,000 species of algae typically swimming around in a lake or floating around in a lake. And on average, each of those algae is interacting with probably 50 to 100 other types of things. Um, to actually isolate what the cause is of a change in the abundance of any one species is a PhD project just in itself in the lab, <laughs> first of all. Uh, for example, there was a chap years ago who spent four years figuring out that selenium was an issue for one particular type of algae. The common advice is uh, take a deep breath, sit back and wait a week and it'll probably go away. Okay, I'll come back to that because that I, I want to ask you a follow up on that one a little later on. Another one, uh, another a question um, that I guess this would be for for Liz. Um, if you draw water from a lake and and use a water filtering system with UV light, can you still use the water for your household drinking, bathing, etc.? Um, I wouldn't. I don't. I don't think those uh, treatment things have been shown to be effective in, in breaking down toxins, but that's as far as I know. Okay. I, so yeah, to be on the safe side, I, I wouldn't, if you see a bloom, I wouldn't use the water for um, anything until a couple weeks after you can't see the bloom anymore. Yeah. I noticed that uh, public health units typically uh, say to people, don't, you don't drink the water, even if you boil it. Um, oh yeah. Definitely in fact, not. that can actually increase the the, uh, the toxin content in the water that you're drinking and make it much more dangerous. So, but filtration systems, UV systems and so on, most of those, all of those systems don't seem to be effective. As far as I know. Yeah, remember people have died, okay? And um, I, the one I didn't hear mentioned was activated charcoal. And, and I think if there was any one system that might work is if you have a really good activated charcoal system that might draw out organics, but I'm just, hypothesizing there. Barb, I hear you're nodding. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. Yeah, Be because of the nature of the of the organism itself, right? You're not you're not going to be able to get rid of it with ultraviolet light or any of those means. But yet yeah, activated charcoal might might work. So we have a question that's kind of a follow up from that about what happens to algal blooms when it start when the lake starts to freeze up. Um, there's some indication that that that, that the algal bloom can actually winter over, so to speak. Is that, is that true? Um, and what happens, what happens then when the ice melts in the spring? Ulysses, you wanna talk, you wanna start with that? Sure, yeah. Well, it's, it's actually kind of appalling how little we know about winter limnology or about what happens in the lake under the ice because uh, so many fewer people study that compared to the summer. Um, but certainly the bloom forming species we see in the summer they have cells in those blooms that can survive at the bottom of the lake through the winter and then be brought back and re-germinated in the summer. Okay, Norman? Yeah, I'll just make one comment. Liz is absolutely right. There's very little work done on winter limnology because most of us limnologists are lazy and don't have good enough coats <laughs> and don't like drilling holes in the ice. We're not uh, descendant from ice fishermen. But if I'll tell you the fascinating thing about winter limnology happens if it's a windy winter and the snow blows off the ice. And so the ice is actually clear. You kind of get an upside down ecosystem on the bottom of the ice. You'll get algae growing in strings hanging off the bottom of the ice. And then animals come up and start grazing kind of up in this upside down world where there's a solid clear glass layer. And that's of course the sunniest part of the lake. So there's enough sun gets through that so that algae grow on the bottom of the ice and that fuels an entire under ice food web. Uh, that has been studied really well in places like, like Baikal in Russia and in the Arctic. And sometimes there are strings of algae that are six inches, eight inches long. So if you can picture yourself swimming under the ice there would be strings of life hanging down off the bottom of the ice and lots of animals moving through it, a kind of upside down universe. Okay, anything to add to that, Barb? 
That's fantastic. I just now I want to go snorkeling under the ice. Not really, but <laughs> but okay. you know maybe not. <laughs> but, okay. but just, uh, Liz, to follow up on your point there about about winter um, and how some you know, of course some of these species can survive dormant, you know, in the sediments over winter. Then we also have the the challenge, right? Uh, when the when the ice leaves the lake and then we have turnover happen again you know, you're bringing all those nutrients back up to the surface and then you have, right, the potential for uh, those organisms to immediately start doing their thing, right, as soon as conditions are, are good. Correct? Right. Yeah. Okay, so that, that same questioner had a follow-up, which was that uh, the lake water in his lake tested twice uh, or sorry, tested uh, twice negative for micro um, assistance. But what his question is, is once an algal bloom exists, can the presence of cyanobacterial toxins come and go? Um, oh. I'm trying to interpret that question. Maybe, yeah, Norm, did you have a thought on that? No, I actually don't know the answer to that. Because I don't know what the conditions are that lead to the formation of particular toxins in a bloom. No, I don't think anyone knows. Okay, so we'll move on to the next one. Um, someone, uh, another person asked whether or not there would be any value in trying to remove broom, uh, a blue-green algae bloom from a lake. People do it. Like in China, they do it. They have huge factories set up to try to filter the water out and then they you they try to use it for other things um i met a guy at a conference who's creating like a foam for shoes out of the algae and you can actually look them up i think he had like a nike shoe or <laughs> like a shoe with nike uh -huh. um but it's a very um like energetically I, i'm not sure if it's an efficient process and if you're not doing it i don't know i don't see that happening here <laughs> So, so, so Terry, could I just ask a, just a question about that to, to Liz and Norman, whoever, you know, this idea of potentially other um, organisms that might uh, become adapted to, to feeding on blue-green algae, right? We've had other invasive species or organisms that, you know, start to populate within ecosystems and other organisms become able to, you know, to feed on those things, right? recognizing that blue-green algae, I guess, are not very palatable to the lawnmowers of the lake, which are our daphnids. Are there other things that, uh, that may, you know, that may incorporate those as part of a food web uh, structure? They're recognizing that we're going to have blue-green algal blooms into the future. They're not going to disappear overnight. Are there things that might, you know, uh, be able to, within a lake system, uh, start to consume those in any sort of significant way. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I do. Cause I, I saw a student in our department defend his PhD a couple years ago and he looked at um, whether you could use a certain type of snail <laughs> to do yeah. that. And he studied Lake Taihu in, in China where there's massive algal blooms. And he was able to show that these snails could effectively um, eat it and clear it up and, and make it settle out. So I mean, you could, but do you really want to put all those snails into your lake? <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know. <laughs> Not, but. Right. So, Norm, you, you are the, um, the expert on, 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 the, on the lake's little lawnmowers. Is there, you know, what, what, um, what role would, a, uh, would the um, Daphnia play in being able to control blue-green algae blooms? Uh, Daphnia, a very little role, because of all the types of algae that are out there, uh, they're the least nutritious for Daphnia. There are some uh, shoreline dwelling um, relatives of Daphnia that uh, can graze on the filamentous blue-green algae like spaghetti. They hold it in their front appendages and kind of stuff it into their mouth. So there are some uh, of these uh, Clodostra that live near shore that can eat, uh, um, can eat blue-green algae. Uh, and it's kind of amazing that there aren't more. So the thing to do would be to go to the Great Salt Lake area, you know, lakes where they have nothing but blue-green algae and look at the animal life. And in those lakes, uh, in there, I don't know if there's snails, but there certainly are a few crustaceans and one fly uh, that exists by the quadrillion uh, 
the larvae of these fly, flies can eat, eat that uh, blue-green algae in it. And it's the pink water that, uh, that Liz showed in one of her earlier slides. But I don't think it's the way to go. I agree with this. I think the way to go is to figure out what kind of lakes are most at risk, keep the nutrient supplies as low as possible to minimize the probability. And if I was going to look at an intervention, it, it might be a lake mixing intervention, something like that. If you could keep the bottom water oxygenated um, somehow, and there are ways to do that, the engineering solutions that don't involve adding chemicals, but just involve mixing. Uh, I think those are the most, prop, the most promising venues for, for minimizing the risk of blooms. I agree but, with that, yeah. Okay, so there's a question that's been asked that gets awfully close to talking about the bylaw that's under discussion. And we're, we're trying to draw a line between <clears throat> those questions and more scientific questions. But Liz, you did raise, your, you did raise the, 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 the point about the shoreline being important to be able to slow down or reduce um, the flow of nutrients to the lake. Um, and that we're going to, under climate change conditions, we're, we're anticipating um, higher levels of extreme weather events, including large downpours and so on and so forth. Uh, Norm, you've also mentioned about road salt and how important it is to keep road salt uh, out of our lakes because of the damaging effects that they have. Could you comment, I mean, just generally with respect to shorelines, um, about, the, about the importance of shorelines for being able to, to, to minimize the risk that we know is coming, the increased risk with climate change? Yeah. Um... I don't have any like stats off the top of my head, but we just, we know that plants are so effective in intercepting any runoff that's coming off the land, whatever is in that runoff and um, taking it up and kind of filtering it before it gets to the lake and wetlands are really important for that too. Um, and not just for like nutrient pollution runoff or road salt runoff, also just for erosion. If you don't want to erode your shoreline with these extreme events that we're expecting into the future. Um, keeping natural shorelines intact and keeping the natural vegetation intact can help with all of those things. So why would you remove it? Okay. Barb? You I, I'll continue? just add to that, Terry. I just got to get a prop here, just a second. <laughs> this is what I use when I, when I do talks about shorelines. Some of you are familiar with the great Jenga game, yes? So, so, so one of the things I, I try to get in people's minds about shoreline is the shorelines is they're composed of all sorts of uh, plants and animals arranged in a certain way and they, they have certain functions and the more of those things you take away, you know, the, it's just like the Jenga game, the more of those pieces you take away or influence, the less stable the, the Jenga puzzle is, right? And and the less stable the shoreline is. So, so I, I, I liken it to, uh, you know, death by a thousand cuts, right? When we, when we make those changes, it just, uh, it just creates uh, the potential for there to be more, more impact uh, as a result of that activity. We, you know, we try to have to try to keep it natural as best as we can. And that's what Liz, as you've said, right? We can't control the climate, uh, but so what can we control? Um, what are we able to control within our within our sphere of influence? And that's one thing we can control is is uh, is how we how we impact that um, that shoreline. So here, 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 here. I'll add to that. I agree with everything that's been said, with the possible exception that we can't control the climate. You know, individually yes, know. <laughs> we can't, but maybe collectively we can. And then yeah. I'll add one other thing: um, if we had no plants on the landscape all of our lakes would have algal blooms. And the reason they'd all have algal blooms is that the phosphorus levels in rainfall are about three or four times higher typically than the phosphorus levels in a typical Halliburton lake. Um, Liz, I haven't seen the latest data from Washa, but my recollection is that typically rainfall that's collected in Dorset has 20 or 30 micrograms per liter of phosphorus in it. So where does that phosphorus go? Uh, because it doesn't end up in the lakes. It's all taken up by, it, it feeds the plants on the landscape and then the animals that those plants support. So the more natural that landscape is, it actually, think of that as a huge, if you had one metaphor, 
and they're worried about blue green algae. It's a huge filter for all the phosphorus, uh, a huge sponge for all that phosphorus coming down out of the air and uh, in rain and snow. And so the more of it we can protect, the better. Okay, so I'm just monitoring the questions that are coming in on the chat line, uh, in the chat box. And one of them is, are, the person asks, are tea, uh, tea stained lakes less susceptible to blue green algal blooms? That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. One of the lakes I studied in my thesis was, is tea stained. Um, and it, it still had algal blooms <laughs> and ones that were producing um, actually really high concentrations of toxins. So it might just alter the type of cyanobacteria, maybe ones that are um, can tolerate lower light conditions. Um, but I, I'm not sure that it makes them any less susceptible. Nor Norman, am I not, it's not correct in that those colored lakes tend to also potentially increase uh, water temperatures somewhat because of the nature of those compounds? Yeah, the other, uh, I agree with Liz and Barb that there, there actually can still be blue-green algal blooms in tea stained lakes. Uh, and they do absolutely get hotter. So mm -hmm. I think we have tea stained lakes that are hitting 29 degrees at the surface. Uh, up here in Halliburton and Muskoka now, those are unreasonably high temperatures for a Muskoka type lake. They also tend to have slightly higher phosphorus to start with uh, because the T compounds come in associated with more organic phosphorus. Um, and finally, color levels are rising generally in lakes in Muskoka and Halliburton. Uh, so that will exaggerate the warming at the surface because more of the sun's energy is absorbed than in the surface browner layers. It's not bad or good, but you know some changes are good like rising pH, some changes are bad like rising phosphorus, and some changes, who knows, like rising DOC. Muskoka lakes and the organic, the T levels are probably returning to levels that were there prior to acid rain. And that's another area uh, uh, that Liz's alma mater at Queens, that lab has documented that change, the falling organic carbon levels, and then the rising organic carbon levels brilliantly. Uh, and I think, Liz, that included Muskoka lakes as well, did it not? I'm gonna... Yeah, I'm sure it did. I've, I've had that reconstruction run on my study lakes as well, and they're still much lower in organic carbon than they were in the 1800s prior to acidification. Okay, so we've had a question that um, pertains to reservoir lakes that are where the lake levels are controlled by the Trans Severn water system. Uh -huh. they, so, what the person is asking whether or not uh, lake levels um, have any impact on blue green algal, algal blooms. Yeah, they do definitely. And it's kind of complicated how they'll impact algal blooms because so the volume of the lake, like if the lake's higher, that, um, and you have the same amount of phosphorus in it, it'll dilute the phosphorus over a larger area. So in that way, if you have lake level drops, it can concentrate nutrients and make nutrients more available. Um, but also a deeper lake or, or high lake levels could trigger that thermal layering of water, which could then deplete bottom water oxygen and cause internal nutrient loading. So it's, it's kind of complicated how it can affect blooms, but it certainly can. Okay, anybody else want to comment on that or we move on? Okay, looks like we're going to move on. So there's also, I, that same person was talking about um, the uh, wakes and, and wave action that's created by boats and so on. There was a comment about calm waters actually leading to conditions which can generate uh, or increase the risk of green blue algal blooms. So I take it that, uh, that boat wakes and, and wave action generally can get it, can mix up the lake and can at one level anyway, reduce the possibilities for, for green algal blooms to form. It's complicated. <laughs> My, it's everything. It's, yeah. It sounds like everything's complicated. Yeah. Can I, can I tackle that? Um, yeah, sure. Well, just kind of pulling ideas out of the air here. Um, I think 
the principal mechanism by which boat activities and wakes would influence algal blooms is by shoreline disturbance with the waves and erosion because the amount of mixing induced by boats would pale by comparison to the amount of mixing induced just by the wind. And um, it's, it's hard to imagine how dynamic lakes really are, but at typical wind speeds in Muskoka, if you go down to the end of your dock in the summer, um, in the morning, and then go back in the evening, the water that you looked at in the morning will be a kilometer or two down the lake. Um, so there, it's an enormous dynamo, wind-driven mixing in lakes, far more than what a particular boat uh, could actually do. But that's in terms of actually the mixing of the lake itself. Um, but uh, if, if there's poorly managed shorelines and lots of mixing of wakes in those shorelines and it's stirring up uh, sediments from the shorelines, that I think might have an impact, at least locally. Okay. Anyone? All right, I'm just trying to check the, the chat list again and, and looking at the, um, yes, there's a couple of comments about people wanting to uh, have a copy of uh, Elizabeth's presentation. Um, and as we indicated, the, uh, uh, a, um, a video of this entire thing will be, will be available on the Environment Halliburton website as soon as we can get it up there. But I suppose we can also um, put up a separate and distinct copy of, of uh, Elizabeth's presentation as well. So we'll attempt to do that as soon as we can um, and let you, let you know, let all participants know, particularly those that were not able to get in. Um, let me just see what we've got here. Uh, Elizabeth, how do, science, how do scientists attach a year and date to a given, a given layer of your paleo so soil core? Um, in the lakes that I studied, you can do it in different ways, but the lakes that I studied, we use radioisotopes. Um, it's called, you might've heard of carbon dating. They do it a lot for like dinosaur fossils and stuff and like art artifacts. Um, but uh, if you're looking at shorter time scales, like I looked at, like in the last couple of centuries, we use radioisotopes of lead. So basically like lead will naturally decay, um, to like a half half of its amount every 22 years. So we can use that measurement to um, measure the amount of lead at the top of the core and going back and assign specific ages to each layer. But if you're really lucky and you're in like these really cool lakes, especially ones that permanently have no oxygen at the bottom, um, they have what's called varves in the sediment, um, which are like, uh, it's almost like tree rings, like yeah, like the lines on tree rings, you can actually count back layers in the sediment. But I used radioisotopes. Okay. Um, there's a question about the, about another question about blue-green um, algal blooms. And if, if there is a bloom, is there any way to tell how far the, the, the cyanotoxins will be spread throughout the lake from the course, from, from the place of that, of that bloom itself? No. You can like you can look at where the the current is going, maybe, and it'll <clears throat> the toxins will probably accumulate most where the algae biomass is accumulating most, like on certain shorelines. Um, but uh, the toxins themselves can be released from the cells, and they're invisible, so we can measure and see what the toxins are at that specific spot. But um, I don't think there's any real way of knowing how far they've gone. From the visible accumulation of the bloom. And I take it that's why um, public health units basically as soon as a, a blue-green algae bloom or cyanobacterial bloom is established that's been on the lake, they just basically give a blanket request for everybody to stop going in the lake, stop letting your pet, pets drink out of it, and don't use it for any potable water sources or even showering. That's, that's why, it's because you don't know how far the cyanobacteria would have actually spread throughout the lake. Yeah. yeah, I just I just want to emphasize strongly that you should not be drinking the water. Like the blooms are happening at the surface, probably releasing the toxins at the surface. That water is very mobile under the influence of the wind. And so if your lake is a kilometer long and the toxins are produced at one end in the morning, they'll be at the other end by the evening, uh, chances are. So it's very dangerous to assume that you can drink the water from anywhere if there's an active bloom. 
And Barb, did you want to say something about yeah, that? I just wanted to just just ask a sort of a question or add to that. Um, I did I, I studied or did some field work on a, a lake in um, um, lake uh, shallow lake in Quebec a number of years ago, and it was just absolutely plagued by blue green algal growth, pea soup green. Um, and there was some suggestion or evidence that they were actually getting um, microcystins in well water. So I don't know if there's any, you know, possible connection there. Do either of you have thoughts about that? Whether or not that could be possible. Was it a um, was it a seepage lake? Was it a lake on the shield or? No, it was a super shallow lake surrounded by agriculture, about nine meters deep average depth, uh, one inflow, one outflow, and uh, really, really shallow sort of flat terrain. Hmm. Um, but they were, they were actually cautioning people around the lake not even to drink water out of their, out of their uh, wells. What do you think, Liz? Wow, I've, I've never heard I, of that. I don't know, I, I don't know. crazy. Yeah, it was. But but just I'm just going to Norman's point about about drinking the water. You have to be uh, super careful. Yeah, yeah. don't if drink it. it. <laughs> if it was a perched lake in deep till, and there was a long lived algal bloom, mm -hmm. then that the water in that lake is connected to the regional aquifer. I mean, it's potentially connected to a regional aquifer. Yeah. So I think this is possible. Well, that's what I'm wondering. You know, is it possible to be connected that way? And you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway. That's really interesting. Scary. Yeah, it was a bit but interesting also more and scary. important to basically do what we can to stop uh, the risk of these things from happening. Exactly. All right. So do we have any idea of an average range in the time of days or weeks that a bloom can last? It can vary. <laughs> it can be really short. Like I, I watched one on Nipissing that was there for a few hours in the afternoon. Um, versus like one of the lakes that I studied in Algonquin Park had a bloom persist for months, like throughout the entire growing season. And they can even become permanent, I think, in some um, lakes that like more tropical lakes. Well, the voyageurs, when they first, you know, uh, paddled through Lake of the Woods, the big southern basin of Lake of the Woods in the 1700s were paddling through enormous algal blooms that were completely natural. Yeah. In the 1700s, I think it was. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, that's an important part point too that the algal blooms are natural phenomenons, uh, phenomena, but we think they're occurring more frequently now with a warming climate. Yeah. And I take it also with there's an increased risk as a result of more development on shorelines, more nutrients coming from from you know, elimination of, of vegetation on shorelines would actually then mean more nutrients generally in the water column. And so all those things coming together, particularly under conditions of uh, a warming climate would tend to create a higher risk. Uh, yes. even, though, even though it existed back in the 1700s, I, I guess what I'm saying is that, would you agree that, the, that there's an increased risk uh, generally now as a result of the nutrients that are being added by, by humans, plus also the warming climate? Yes. Okay. But I also think it's important to um, like do the, if you have monitoring le records that reach far back enough or do a paleo study to see what the baseline nutrient levels prior to disturbance were. Um, because like a lot of our lakes around around Halliburton are like really low in, in phosphorus still. And um, so it, prob maybe nutrients haven't increased that much, but how will we know if we don't um, have <laughs> records that span into the pre-disturbance period or if we don't do a paleo study? Okay, so another question has to do with, um, quite apart from drinking the water, uh, what do you say about people going into the water when there's a, a blue-green algae bloom anywhere nearby? Or on that lake anywhere. Yeah, you just you should you shouldn't do it, because <laughs> and especially like for kids or pets because they'll ingest the water and that's kind of the main way that that th these toxins could make you sick. Um, but uh, you can get like contact dermatitis and stuff from the toxins too. So okay, should avoid them. 
Barb? Yeah, and just to add, you know, the lake I worked on in Quebec, we had to get special permission to even put a boat on the water. That's how serious it was. So, you know, and wore, wearing gloves and, and, and so, yeah, you, you have to be careful for sure. Okay, so there was a quote, you made, made reference in your presentation, Elizabeth, about um, various kinds of ways we could probably artificially reduce the, the risk of, um, of, of, of blue-green algae blooms. One of them which was, was the aeration, uh, aeration systems that you could put in place. The other one had to do with um, some kind of a product, I think it was called Foslock, which, which uh, covers the, the, the sediment and would, would tend to uh, make, make the release of phosphorus less likely um, uh, in low oxygen circumstances on, on the lake bottom. Um, so what, can you say a couple things about that? You, do, you, do you think that those kinds of ways of being able to compensate for the increased risk are worth looking at? Um, I do, um, especially in cases where keeping blooms managed is important because it's a drinking water source. Um, I think those in lake treatments, um, I guess, need to be looked at and considered because um, people need to be able to drink the water. But generally, like they're they're not always effective, especially in larger lakes. Um, I think the best ones, like Norman was talking about earlier, are the ones that aim to inject oxygen in the bottom layers without disrupting natural stratification. So not not these aerators that kind of mix the whole water column. Um, but yeah, they're these and, and Fosslock could work too, but with Fosslock, if the if your problem is nutrients coming in from the watershed and you apply Fosslock, it might uh, stop your blooms temporarily, but as the nutrients build up again uh, in the sediments, like Fosslock is not gonna fix your problems if the problem is not simply um, internal loading. So it, it may in fact be a temporary solution at best. Um, it would be, I, I would imagine expensive to put something across an entire lake surface so that it would cover the, the sediment on the bottom. Um, and then it's only gonna be a temporary fix. Okay. okay. That's my thought on it. Okay. Um, another questioner wants to know if leaves falling into the lake um, cause it a surge in nutrients available for algae blooms? Who wants I'm to tackle sure. that one? <laughs> I think- um, Go ahead, Norman. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember her, her name and I'm really embarrassed. Charlie Trick's wife- Irina was, Creed. Yeah, uh, I've talked to her about this too. Yeah, Irina Creed, who's a brilliant limnologist and wetland biologist, and would wag her finger at me by calling her Charlie Trick's wife, <laughs> even though she is Charlie Trick's wife. Um, the, uh, she hypothesized at one point that the combination of fall, uh, leaf fall coupled with longer, warmer waters uh, might actually be a cause of a, a local phosphorus input enough to cause a bloom in the late fall. I think people are so shocked by these late fall algal blooms that they're looking for uh, all kinds of potential hypotheses to explain it. Um, the one thing that I think is true is um, trees are not very good at pulling nutrients out of leaves before they lose, before they let them go in the fall. I know, for example, that they don't pull any of the calcium out of their leaves. They just assume it'll be recycled after, well, they don't make any assumptions. At least the last <laughs> tree I asked didn't make any assumptions. Uh -huh. But um, so I think it is possible locally. It's a small lake surrounded by lots of maple trees that would lose all their leaves at once. That could cause a local pulse of nutrients. Okay, so there's another question. Well, there's two questions about fish. One is declining fish populations uh, in any way, shape or form related to the increased risk of algal blooms. And secondly, is it safe to eat the fish in a lake that has got a bloom? I don't know. You know, Liz? Um, which, which question, the first question? 
Yeah, let's do the first one first. Is overfishing in any way, shape, or form and building fish stocks back up, is that any part of any kind of an algal bloom risk reduction strategy? Um, yeah, I'm not sure, actually. I've never seen any direct link. Like, there can always be, like, food web, or we call it, like, trophic cascades, where, like, if one thing, like, the fish really decrease, then the things that they eat will really increase and it can kind of cascade down the food web, but I've never read any direct links to fish populations yeah. and blooms. I think there absolutely could be a link between what's happening with fish and algal blooms, but whether it's blue green algal blooms, I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. You can certainly end up with localized more algae of um, any type, depending on what happens with the fish. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about eating the fish? These aren't the same toxins as uh, lead to, you know, the red tides in the ocean that shellfish pick up where you can't eat the shellfish. Um, they're very different than that, but I haven't heard anyone mention that you can't eat the fish. But I see, Barb, what do you think? You are Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would be more concerned about uh, lead and mercury and other metals in fish, freshwater fish particularly, the, than I would be about... Um, about microcystins, I've never heard of any sort of relationship between those things building up in fish tissue, for example. I don't, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't see that as a, as a, as a, as a concern. Personally, I've, I've never heard of that, so. It's getting, uh, it's, it's past nine o'clock, and so I, and we're, we're about at the end of the list of the, of the questions. There's a, there's a couple of comments I want to go back to before we finish, but this one question about Lake of Bays. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the person asks that, uh, or says that the Lake of Bays had a bloom in one of its bays. Only those that were in the bay were advised to be cautious about using the water. Was that appropriate? Well, I would lean on whatever the public health people said was appropriate. Um, yeah, and I would like to know what the bay is. There are certainly are some bays on Lake of Bays that might as well be separate lakes that are yeah. very, very isolated from the rest of the lake. So if it was one of those bays, I think they were probably safe to, you know, make that recommendation. Okay. So I just wanted to pass on a comment from Ulinx. Uh, the Ulinx Center for Community-Based Research is located in Minden. Um, is uh, looking at monitoring lake bottom dissolved oxygen concentrations with a number of Halliburton Lake Associations. And they're saying that if you're interested, please contact Brendan Martin at Ulinx. Okay, so Ulinx is looking for some volunteer from Lake Associations to help out with that project. Okay, I think with that, let me just take a quick look and see if there's anything else outstanding here. Uh, I think... Uh, I'm not sure. I don't want to really ask a question about a specific lake and a bloom. I, I don't know whether or not you folks would be able to interest, uh, answer it anyway, but I'm going to leave that um, uh, for, another, for another day. So, okay, well, th with that, I think we'll just call the, uh, an end to the formal question and answer period. But if anybody's got any additional questions that, that arise as a result of listening to what, uh, what Liz had to say or any of the comments or questions that were made, please put them in the chat function. We'll leave that open for a while after the close of the meeting, and then we'll, uh, we'll try to get back to people. Also, please remember to, uh, to take advantage of giving us some suggestions about where we should go from here with respect to future enviro cafes, um, either related to lake health um, or the shoreline bylaw or whatever. Uh, we, we'd love to see those kinds of comments and suggestions. So once again, thank you, Elizabeth, for your presentation. Thank you, Norman and Barb, for your excellent sort of, you know, panel discussion here and, and being able to, 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 uh, to, uh, to, to fill out the conversation. So thank you all for attending. And I'm going to turn things back now to, to Susan Hay. So thanks once again to our speakers and also to uh, Eric Lilius, our Zoom controller, and Terry Moore for uh, fielding the questions. And it is a shame that there was a wrinkle in our Zoom plan. So although we paid for a meeting that would ha handle a thousand, uh, Zoom seems to have capped us at a hundred. So uh, I'm sorry to those of you who joined late because you couldn't get in earlier. Uh, we have recorded the presentation as well as the Q&A session and it will be posted on our website as soon as we can get it there. So if you weren't able to see it or you wanna watch it again, uh, you will be able to.
Um, so as Terry mentioned, we, we do have plans for interesting Enviro cafes coming up. Uh, the next one will be March the 9th and uh, please stay tuned. And uh, hopefully we can uh, uh, figure out figure out that, what happened with our Zoom and prevent that from happening again. Uh, I will be sending out a resource list and some information about a couple of uh, uh, lake health issues uh, that Dr. Yan will be speaking um, at in a, a few days. And uh, we we do need your support to keep uh, putting these informative events on. So please consider. Make, uh, becoming a member or making a do donation on our website. Thank you again for participating in our Enviro Cafe this evening, and I wish you a good night. Thanks for having me. Uh, great excellent. job, Liz. Great excellent. job. Great. Really, really excellent.